Sociology Robot. Hello and welcome to the sixth video lecture on OCRA Level Sociology Paper 1, looking at high and popular culture. In previous videos, we looked at the idea of culture as the norms and values that make up a society and that make that society distinctive. Within a culture, there are going to be different aspects, different styles of culture going on. And the OCR exam board wants students to understand high and popular culture, global and consumer culture, subcultures, and the phenomenon of cultural hybridity. And we'll start off with the first two. High culture, then, as the name suggests, is the culture of the elite, the most powerful and influential people in society. It's sometimes termed posh. And by that we mean it has high status. People look up to it. So we've got high culture restaurants. These tend to be, for example, French restaurants where the menu itself will be in French and you're expected to know what that means. Vintage wines. Again, the labels will be in French or Italian and you're supposed to know a good year from a bad year. And then there's dishes like caviar, which looks very strange and quite unappetizing, and uh, many people wouldn't really know what to do with it when first presented with it. You've got high cultural art forms like opera, ballet, fine art, classical music. Many people find these rather difficult to enjoy on first viewing. Uh, quite often, again, there are language barriers. Many operas are in Italian, for example, or German. People need to be educated into how to enjoy this sort of art. Then you've got the lifestyle of high culture. Owning horses, spending time on yachts, hobbies like hunting and shooting. And perhaps rather crucial to high culture, at least in the UK, is a childhood spent at one of the public schools. Now, in America, public school means a, a state school. But in the UK, a public school is one of the elite independent schools, like, for example, Eton. A crucial feature of high culture is that it's exclusive, and by this we mean that it is not for ordinary people. It could be expensive, but it's usually more than just the expense. It requires a special education. We've mentioned that it's often in foreign languages or sometimes really quite obscure languages, and special skills and education are needed to appreciate it. And that's why it is privileged. High culture is highly valued. It's often linked to intelligence, good taste, success. You're seen as somehow a better person if you understand, and enjoy, can talk about high culture. Of course, at the other end, you've got popular culture. And this is the culture of ordinary people. It is popular with the majority. Sometimes it's referred to as being common, a word that means it's got low status. Popular culture is enjoyable, it just doesn't carry much influence. For example, you've got fast food, fizzy drinks, the sort of products you can buy in supermarkets that are enjoyed by the majority of the population. You've got, as opposed to opera, popular music. You've got art forms like graffiti. And then you've got the whole media entertainment side of things. Hollywood movies, TV series, soap operas, celebrity culture. Of course, football is a massive part of popular culture in the UK. Package holidays that people enjoy abroad. And not going to one of the expensive and elite public schools, but attending a local state school. If high culture is exclusive, then popular culture is inclusive. It's available to everybody. It's easy to access, easy to enjoy. No particular education or training or preparation is needed. Anybody can pick up and eat a burger and enjoy it. But perhaps because of that, popular culture is stigmatised. It's looked down on. It's seen to suggest a lack of intelligence, a lack of style. It's seen as the culture of rather unsuccessful people. 
Let's look at a key scholar who has investigated culture. And here we have Pierre Bourdieu, a great French sociologist of the 20th century. He wouldn't be described as a Marxist, but he was certainly influenced by Marxism. Bourdieu's great work is his book Distinction, which was published in Britain in 1979. Bourdieu carried out a survey of 1,217 French people, uh, mostly in Paris and in a small rural French town. He wanted to make sure he was getting a wide range of respondents. And he followed up these surveys with some interviews as well, so he could get into depth and detail. He discovered that taste was strongly linked with social class. Now, that isn't a surprising conclusion, but he found that it's particularly linked not so much to the social class that people have, but rather to the social class that they aspire to. Bourdieu coins a very important term, which is cultural capital. Now, you might be familiar with the word capital. It's the title, after all, of one of Karl Marx's great books. Capital normally refers to money, but now we can make a distinction between economic capital, wealth and money, and cultural capital, which means tastes, pastimes and lifestyles, the knowledge and skills, a package of things that are valued in society so that they offer opportunities and open doors for you in the same way that money does. Bourdieu points out that wealthy people will pay poorer but educated people to provide high culture for them. For example, getting a string quartet to come and play classical music at your wedding. Bourdieu has another term linked to cultural capital, which is habitus. And by habitus, Bourdieu means your lifestyle that reveals your cultural capital. So, for example, if at the weekend you like to go and see Shakespeare in the park and you enjoy high cultural pastimes, then this reveals your habitus and the social class that you feel you belong in. How can we evaluate these ideas about culture? Well, we can start off taking a functionalist perspective. Functionalism believes that traditions have been handed down from the past and that these traditions have value, so high culture represents the best of our traditions. This means that the functionalists are going to see high culture as superior to popular culture. It is genuinely more intelligent and more rewarding. In fact, many functionalists would argue that high culture improves the people who consume it, who listen to it and watch it and read it. It makes you more thoughtful, more sensitive, more intelligent, perhaps even more moral, perhaps even a better person. Despite this view of high culture, functionalists don't entirely look down on popular culture because they see that it unites people. And remember, functionalists believe it is very important for people to be united by shared values. This creates social solidarity and it keeps anomie at bay, that state of meaningless and disconnection that leads to all sorts of personal and social problems. Marxists and feminists come from a conflict perspective. So they're not going to agree that the high culture of the ruling classes is just superior to the popular culture that ordinary people enjoy. They would argue that there's nothing superior about champagne or caviar or Shakespeare. It's just treated as if it was better. It is given privilege. They would argue that high culture reflects ruling class ideology, if they're Marxists and feminists would say it reflects patriarchal ideology. And that means the effect it has on society is actually quite bad. It causes alienation, making people feel unworthy if they uh, can't appreciate this culture. It justifies the class system because it seems to be saying that the ruling classes in society are genuinely better than everybody else because they can enjoy this high culture. It justifies unearned privilege. Let's look at some problems with this distinction between different types of culture. Take, for example, jazz music. Now, in many ways, jazz resembles high culture. Many people would say it's quite hard to listen to. 
It also uses many of the instruments associated with classical music. However, it's also a form of popular culture. It often takes pop songs as its melodies. Art forms like this are a little bit difficult to place in the high culture, popular culture binary. Then you've got the position of Shakespeare in our culture. Shakespeare is certainly high culture. It's been adapted into films such as the 1996 Romeo and Juliet with Claire Danes and Leonardo DiCaprio. It's been adapted into musicals like West Side Story, also based on Romeo and Juliet. And for a while it was incredibly popular to adapt Shakespeare into romantic comedies of the movies. Like the 1999 film Ten Things I Hate About You with Julia Stiles and Heath Ledger. We also need to bear in mind that popular culture turns into high culture over time. Shakespeare's theatre was, in the 16th century, enjoyed by everybody, not just the educated elite. Let's stick with Shakespeare, and uh, this could be quite useful for AO2, knowledge and application in the exam. Shakespeare has an unusual role in British culture. He's part of the national curriculum, which means it is compulsory for schools to teach some Shakespeare to students. However, it's quite difficult for many schoolchildren to understand the 16th century English that Shakespeare uses. How can we justify something like this on the school curriculum? A functionalist would argue that Shakespeare is superior literature. It improves young people's minds, whether they realise it or not. So you offer them Shakespeare so that their imagination can grow, so their moral awareness can deepen, so that their language skills can become more sophisticated. Other sociologists, perhaps from the conflict perspective, would disagree with this, but they might argue that Shakespeare is still a valuable qualification and that it provides opportunities for students. So even if Shakespeare doesn't do anything for you as a person, knowledge of Shakespeare will make it easier for you to get certain top jobs and good university courses. A different view of Shakespeare in the curriculum would be that it's a bad thing, but not because it's hard or boring, but because it embodies ruling class ideology. It justifies the rule of kings. It's usually got male heroes. And recently, it's been accused of supporting white privilege. Let's sum up. High culture is the culture of the elite. It is exclusive and not open to everybody, but it is privileged and confers a lot of status if you can enjoy it and make it part of your lifestyle. Popular culture is the culture of ordinary people. It is inclusive and easy to access, but it tends to be stigmatised. It is not respected. It's somewhat looked down on. We've been introduced to the work of Bourdieu and his famous book Distinction, in which he introduces the idea of cultural capital, the idea that high culture has a value in society rather like money, and it creates opportunities and a means of social advancement for people who can master it. Let's finish by looking at some exam questions. The most obvious exam question is question one, a six marker, where you could be asked to explain what is meant by high culture or popular culture. And a question like this is asking for a definition and some examples. Don't just list the examples, give some form of description so it's clear that you know what you're talking about. And if you can drop in a little bit of extra sociology as well, such as the idea of being exclusive or inclusive, or privileged or stigmatised, then so much the better. Question number two invites you to look at two sources. One of them a picture, usually, and the other one uh, a piece of writing, maybe about 50 words in length. 
You'll then be asked a question that might go, using sources A and B in your wider sociological knowledge, explain the concept of high culture or popular culture. This is, of course, very similar to question one, except that you have to give a little bit more sociology, and it might be a good idea at this point to bring in the work of Bourdieu and the concept of cultural capital. And, of course, you have to refer to the two sources. With the picture, you should say what you see. If you're looking at source A, you can say that you are seeing an art gallery. The pictures on the walls are huge portraits. There are sculptures. And the people enjoying the art are staring at it very seriously. This is all typical of the way we consume high culture. And with the written source, you should quote from it and then explain how the material in the source connects to the idea of a particular type of culture. Question three is a 20 mark question, and it's the main question in section A, the one that you should spend the most time on, probably 20 minutes. Unlike the previous two questions, question three will ask you to evaluate briefly, where you discuss what functionalists and Marxists might make of the whole idea. Here are two possible questions. Outline and briefly evaluate the view that high culture is becoming less important. This is inviting you to make a case that high culture is increasingly seen as irrelevant to ordinary people's lives, that popular culture is becoming more widespread, even with people who used to look down on it. And you can evaluate this by pointing out that for functionalists, the decline of high culture would be seen as a bad thing because it embodies many of the culture's best traditions. Whereas for Marxists, it would probably be seen as a good thing because it embodies ruling class ideology that, for them, we could all do without. Outline and briefly evaluate the view that popular culture is inferior to high culture. This is a bit more unusual. I'm not entirely sure a question like this is on the cards, but it takes you directly into the main debate. Is high culture objectively superior to popular culture, or has it rather arbitrarily been given certain privileges just because ruling class people like it, and perhaps a lot of popular culture is just as thoughtful, intelligent and worthwhile? I hope that's been helpful. You can find more about culture in my study guide, Socialization, Culture and Identity, and the combined guide with youth subcultures. The links to these are in the description and they're available on Amazon. Sociology Robot